A very good morning to all my dear friends. I am Prashant Mavani. I hope you all are doing good today. It's 23rd June 2020 day is Tuesday. I would like to start today's discussion with adventure. Adventure is worthwhile. Dear friends, whenever you feel you are burned out, whenever you feel like your life is going or stuck in a routine, take out one or two days off. Go out in the wild, climb a mountain or something. You know, not a big one, but a small one is enough as well. One or two days off will give you that energy. Leave everything behind and when you will come back, you will come back with a new energy. So adventure is worthwhile. My personal experience, I can tell you. With this, dear friends, Study IQ team has designed a smart course. Now, this smart course is designed for civil services examination. It covers both pre and mains examination. And to find out more about it, do download our mobile application. To download the PDF of today's lecture, check out my Telegram channel. You can follow me on Facebook. Please make sure that you share this lecture with other students. Hit the like button if you have learned something from today's discussion. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. So, on our table, we have five important articles. The first one is about lone wolf threat. Do you know what lone wolf is all about or who is a lone wolf? I will explain this thing to you. Then we have one article on India and Nepal border issue. We are going to go through some important facts that will back our claim or this stand of India that uh, or basically Nepal is, is wrong, right? Uh, to keep it very simple. Third one is about GST in central police canteens. Uh, we are going to talk about some important things about uh, this uh, uh, CAPF. And then we have uh, Times of India editorial, uh, Dharavi model. Very interesting. And the last one is from Financial Express. This article is written by an IAS officer. This officer is an author as well. He has worked as a secretary uh, of Government of India. So... Is talking about some you know practical things that we can do to revive our economy and this is a very out of the box article the last one particularly is very interesting very important article for your uh, overall understanding for your mains examination and then we will go through some news items uh, so let's crack on with the lone wolf threat dear friends uh, first of all let me throw some light on lone wolf See, nowadays how it works is that earlier on, first of all, let's see what things used to be earlier on. Terrorists, uh, you know, they used to be, uh, they, there was a certain region where you find these terrorist groups living. And then they will try to enter into our region and then they will try to attack us. For example, 2611 attack, right? Uh, they came from Pakistan and uh, you know what they did with our people in Mumbai. Earlier on, we saw something new like 911 was uh, was something very new, right, uh, and, and very dangerous as well. Now things are getting like on security front, security agencies, uh, they have upgraded their technologies and things. So it is getting more and more difficult for these groups to smuggle guns and bombs and other things. So what they have started doing is, you know, nowadays this penetration of digital communication or this online thing, what they do is the handlers, they will recruit people youngsters online they will send them this video clips and uh, you know this sort of videos and as far as i know these videos are manipulated you know they are they have this whole team uh, filming team they have they have editing team they have this uh, publications where they publish fake items right they will ask you or they will brainwash youngsters that uh, if you do this thing then this is this is about protecting your community and uh, if you don't protect your community, you will go to hell. And if you protect your community, you will go to heaven. And these are the things that you will get on heaven. And all these stories are there, right? As I'm, I'm sure you you know how it works. So this lone wolf or this lone wolves or this lone wolf is an individual, right? Who is living in a society like you and I, but that person is radicalized. And when he or she will get order from their handlers, uh, he or she will go out and uh, they will execute an attack. Now, it is very difficult. It is nearly impossible to identify or to detect and prevent this type of uh, lone wolves, right? They are like sleeper cells. The reason why we are discussing this thing is because this is getting, uh, you know, it's every year or not every year, but unfortunately, you know, quite often we hear this sort of news items. 
the latest one is about a knife attack at a park in reading reading is a, is an area in 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 london right uh, reading university i'm not sure how many of you have heard about it but reading is an area in it's not reading it's reading but anyway so this is a reminder of the threat of lone wolf attacks the uk is facing and it's not just uk a few years ago something similar took place in france uh, something similar happened in germany if i'm not wrong in netherlands as well uh, in usa as well in various different parts of the world we find this sort of things right uh, someone will come out with a knife or a gun and uh, they will you know they will try to hit as many people as possible the the, the latest this reading attack the person is a 25 year old libyan national he has been arrested in the connection with the latest attack and british media have reported that uh, khaira uh, shadallah his name is khaira shadallah he uh, was on mi5's radar as well so secret agencies this agencies were ibs and things like military intelligence agency of uk they were behind this person and uh, you know if if there is a coordinated terror attack then it becomes much easier to to follow them and to you know catch them you will have something on it someone has supplied something to them and it becomes means more people are involved so more chances of uh, agencies getting near them but lone wolf attacks or lone wolf attackers they are they are very difficult you know there are so many people and then you have limited staff so you cannot chase each and every single person but even though they are doing quite uh, well particularly this british services they are doing very well they have unfolded m- m- many of this type of attacks and remember this big attack back in 2017 it was it became a world uh, news uh, that uh, a person um he, he drove a car into a pedestrian on the pavement of this bridge that you can see on your screen this this is a very famous place in england isn't it in london this uh, parliament of london and then you have this bridge here you find this bridge and you have seen this bridge in many films so people were walking here this is a very busy place tell you that uh, you know to you find tourists over here so this person he drove a car into pedestrian and he injured some 40 uh, people and he killed six people and finally he was uh, shot by policemen so this sort of attacks are very uh, dangerous uh, so we need to work on you know we need to have a multi pronged strategy we have to de-radicalize uh, youngsters we have to make sure that in society as well people don't start hating any particular community because when you that's what uh, this handlers that's what this organizations they want the more hate like if a and b are not doing very well with each other like a community is not is if, if a community starts hating b community then this handlers they will tell this b community kids that this is the thing that you will get right this is how they treat you you need to you need to attack them you need to take over them and things like that and then b community kids will be they they will become more vulnerable to to rad, to radicalization so i hope this is making sense right So let's move on to the next one this one is about uh, India and Nepal. Now this is not the first time that we are discussing this particular uh, topic uh, earlier on as well we have talked about this treaty of uh, Saugoli uh, so, uh, uh, Sugali treaty of Sugali that took place between British East India Company and uh, the king of Nepal. Uh, so earlier on Nepal was a uh, bit wider and bigger right so nepal was this big let's say right uh, here was satluj river and this is tista river so it was quite wide but after this war anglo british war a uh, big pardon anglo nepalese war uh, nepal is this is today's nepal right so this is how nepal looks like roughly speaking right this is just a sketch it's not up to scale as we know so here is uh, this kali river and kali river is mentioned in this uh, treaty of uh, uh, sugoli right uh, which ended the anglo nepalese war stipulated that the kali river would mark nepal's western border with the british east india company so this is nepal here and this is the western portion of nepal so this is kali river this kali river is the western border of nepal that is clearly mentioned in this treaty of uh, sugoli The root of the misunderstanding between India and Nepal lies in a treaty to end a territorial war 
a territorial war to which no map was attached and the negotiators had no idea of the geography of the area except that devout Hindus on the way to Mansarovar considered the spring at the Kalapani at the base of the Lipulek Pass as the source of the Kali River. But it's not that uh, if no maps were attached to this uh, treaty, then this treaty is vague. After that, after this treaty as well, we have seen many British officers and many uh, important uh, people, they have mentioned uh, the region of this area, right, or this this region here of this Nepal and India, then it was under control of British uh, East India Company. So this is the place here. We have talked about this thing earlier on, but just very a quick glance, right? So this is Nepal here. This is India here. And you can see uh, this is China here. So Nepal has two tri-junctions with India and China. The one in dispute now is Lipu Lake in Kalapani at the border of Uttarakhand with Nepal. In 1816, the Sugoli Treaty signed by Nepal and British India identified Kali River as the Nepal's boundary with India. Nepal claims the river to Kalapani's west is the main Kali and thus Nepal has territorial rights to it. What Nepal is saying that the river that you find here is not Kali. They are saying that the river that you find here, this is Kali here. India holds that a ridge line to Kalapani's east is the border with uh, border. Thus, Kalapani falls within its territory. What India is saying that Kalapani is, uh, you know, that falls Kalapani is in Indian portion, and uh, this is the river that is dividing India and Nepal here. That's what India is saying, and that's what we find in various different documents. For example. Uh, demarcation undertaken by W. J. Webb later in 1816 covered the entire Bias region both to the east and west of the river on the ground that it has traditionally been part of Kumaon prior to 25-year-old occupation by Nepal. The drainage of Kalapani and Lipulek was considered wholly within British territory and it was stated that a short way below the springs, the Kali formed the boundary with Nepal. Then you find uh, this thing as well. The British retained the Kuthi Valley and the Limpia Dhura Pass as well. The British government did not shift the British East India Company boundary as Nepal alleges. The first British resident in Nepal, Edward Gardner, laid out uh, to the Nepal Darbar in correspondence on 4th February 1817 to 10th October 1817. This matter was considered settled as only the lowland lying between the Kali and Gorakhpur that were ceded in 1815 were restored to Nepal by Treaty of 1860. Then we find in 1905, Charles A. Shering, he was Deputy Commissioner of uh, Almora. Almora is a place in Uttarakhand. And Almora, the writer of this article, has been in Almora. He, he, he was Commissioner of Almora or something like that. So... What he is saying is, the reason why he is uh, talking so much about, or the reason why he is presenting this many facts in front of us is because I think he has been to, he has, he has lived in Almora, so he is, you know, well aware about the history and the documents. So in 1905, Charles A. Shering, he was Deputy Commissioner of Almora. He recorded his travels across Lipu Lake into Tibet. He camped at Kalapani and noted its half a dozen springs and Nepal boundary at the Thinker Pass. Remember this Thinker Pass. Now the thing is, China and Nepal, they have their boundary as well. And uh, back in 1963, when they established their permanent boundary markers, uh, they numbered it from number 1 to 79. And the first marker of the Sino-Nepal border is at Thinker. So, these are the points, right? When Nepal is having an agreement with China, the first marker is Thinker. Right. And here as well, clearly see that uh, Charles is sharing back in 1905, he camped at Kalapani and noted its half a dozen spring and the Nepal boundary at Thinker Pass. Trade through Lipu Lake amounting to £26,000 per year or annually had grown tenfold since 1816 and was regulated by British. 1954 trade agreement between India and China mentions Lipu Lake as one of the passes that could be used for trade and pilgrimage traffic. A police post was established by India at Kalapani in 1956. So in 56 and 54, uh, before that as well in 1905, then you have in 1963, it, this was done by China and Nepal. 
So there are so many evidence that clearly states that the current claim by Nepal is not valid because we have so many documents and you cannot just take treaties for granted, right? Uh, this uh, treaties were, uh, you know, this treaties, uh, though they were old treaties, right? Uh, they are old treaties, but they are very important. And you cannot just reject them based on your uh, claims. Uh, so principles of international law as well, they support British and India's claim. So these are a few more points. Uh, you can add these points with our per, uh, earlier discussion. So we have got now enough points uh, about this India and Nepal issue. Moving on to, and we have discussed political points as well earlier on, right? Like how China is backing and uh, this uh, two years of uh, Prime Minister uh, of Nepal and uh, how this uh, trust vote cannot take place and there are so many other things that we have discussed. I hope you remember all those things. Okay, uh, the third one is a case to exempt uh, GST in central police canteens. Uh, first of all, let me remind you guys that uh, CAPF, that is Central Armed Police Force, is a very important topic for your examination, particularly those uh, students preparing for UPSC civil services examination, because this thing is clearly mentioned in your syllabus. So, you should be aware about uh, this basic things that uh, CAPF uh, works under the aegis of Home Ministry. And CAPF comprises uh, CRPF, Border Security Force, that is BSF, Central Industrial Security Force, Indo-Tibetan Border Police, uh, Shashastra Sima Bal, that is SSB, Assam Rifles and Black Cat Commandos National Security Guard. So all this uh, CAPF, right, they fall under the aegis of Home Ministry. And this is the reason why you will find that when news associated with, when you will find news associated with uh, the CAPF, uh, Amit Shah will brief or Home Minister will brief you. And when you have things associated with Defence Forces, then Defence Minister Rajnath Singh will uh, brief the nation. So here, May 2020, in May 2020, early May 2020 to be precise, Union Home Minister Amit Shah announced uh, that uh, only indigenous products will be sold in all central police canteens run by Central Armed Police Force. Now, I have been to this sort of canteens and you find things are very cheap over there. The reason why they are cheap is because uh, earlier on there was no tax or tax was minimum. Many states, uh, they used to give exemption. So there was no vet on items that you find in like soap and oil and so many other things, right? You can buy washing machines and you can buy your sports shoes and so many things are uh, reasonably priced here. But uh, GST, after this, uh, you know, introduction of GST, things are a bit expensive. And this is uh, creating extra burden, financial burden on our forces. So there is a voice rising up, means people or the CAPF people are saying that this personnel, they are saying that their demand is that, of course, they are not out there in the street and they are not protesting, but they are demanding that there should be a sort of exemption of GST in the things that you find here in these canteens. We have some 1,700 canteens in our country, and uh, they, this uh, 1,700 canteens, they serve some 50 lakh family members and 10 lakh serving personnel of a central police canteen uh, this central police canteen they serve this uh, total 60 lakh uh, people right uh, this includes some police personnel and then your uh, srp guys and then your uh, crpf guys and you know state police reserve force and everyone uh, we find some patanjali products here khadi and village uh, industry commission here right they are also trying to generalize their products uh, textile and uniform and other things uh, they want to sell it via this canteens so Exempting or giving them GST exemption will boost the morale of our forces. We all know that uh, our uniformed uh, services, uh, you know, how difficult uh, the terrain is at uh, in India, Tibet, uh, or India Nepal border, uh, India China border, uh, to be precise, not Nepal, India China border. Then uh, the border that we share with Pakistan, it is guarded by BSF. Uh, then our important, uh, like airports, uh, nuclear power plants, etc. They have been protected by Central Industrial Security Forces. Um, uh, do you know this uh, fact that every single day in our country, on an average, uh, six policemen, when I say policemen, I'm talking about this uniform service. I'm not talking about Army, Navy and Air Force. I'm talking about this CAPF and 
police guys, right? Uh, so, every day, six guys, uh, you know, they, they, they are victim of this uh, sort of battle casualty or uh, some sort of uh, gang war taking place and someone gets a bullet. Uh, someone will stab our policeman. So, this sort of things are going on, on every single day. And more police personnel, more CFPF personnel have died when you compare it with uh, our defense forces. Of course, both of them are important. One is important for internal peace. One is uh, important for, uh, you know, to, to stop external attacks. And, uh, you know, hats off to all this personnel and this whole, um, you know, team of our uniform services. But what I'm trying to tell you here is that... Uh, their life is very difficult. You know, they, they, they live a very, very difficult life. Their, their kids, uh, they also live a very difficult life. I know one of my, one of my good friends, right? Uh, his father uh, just retired from CISF. And uh, he has served in very dangerous locations. And uh, I was going through the story, like I mean, story in the sense, he, my friend was telling me like uh, how difficult it was for his family to... You know, his father was away and they used to go through the news and uh, some of the friends of his father, like the, the people who work with his father, right, they passed away in this big ambush and things. So it's very tough. So this, a little bit of, uh, you know, if you, if you, if government is going to exempt uh, this items that you find in this uh, canteen, so it's not going to change. I'm not saying that this is, this is going to be a big thing. It's going to be a tiny gesture, but this tiny gesture matters, right? Uh, this will make their life a bit more, bit more luxurious, I would say, right? Uh, they can, they can, they would be able to afford some more things. It will at least give a little bit of happiness, even though material, but it will give a sense of pride as well as happiness. So, I think government will take a proper action on this thing, and I think government should remove a GST on these items now. There can be challenges, like uh, when I say government, I'm talking about GST Council. First of all, we have to understand that uh, central government cannot take any decision. It is the GST Council that will take decisions. So the states as well as union government together, they have to decide whether, or this GST Council has to decide whether they want to drop this thing or not. I think they will drop it uh, to boost the morale of our forces. Moving on, the Dharavi model. Tharavi is Asia's largest slum, extraordinary in terms of population density. 2,27,136 persons per square kilometer. 2,27,136 persons per square kilometer is extraordinary, right? It is huge. And it was no wonder known as ticking COVID bomb. But local authorities, intelligent and relentless efforts to defuse it have borne fruit. On Saturday, the Union Health Ministry praised Maharashtra government as well as this BMC people because they have actively chased this virus and the rate was some 12% in April. It was brought down to 4.3% in May and at present it is somewhere around 1.02% in June. So this is outstanding. This is impressive because... In a room of 10 by 10 feet, you find some 8 to 10 people living. 80% of people of Dharavi, they have to depend on community toilets. Home isolation is nearly impossible or it's not an option that you get in Dharavi. So what this local administration did, uh, they created this, they converted schools, community halls and other things uh, in a timely fashion. They converted it into quarantine facilities and they set up this... Uh, oximeters and mobile vans and private clinics were roped in other facilities were provided here and assistant uh, municipal commissioner kiran dikavkar says that uh, they did not wait for the cases to reach even 100 to start acting the first fever clinic was in fact set up three days after the first case so the m most important lesson here is timely action quick action and right doing that is uh, logical, doing that you think whatever resources you have, uh, maximum or optimal utilization of resources is the key here. That's what we can learn from Dharavi. Aggressive and accessible testing. Uh, they created trust, uh, right, by distributing fruits and dates and other important things during the 
the month of Ramzan. So they want the trust of uh, the people living here and, uh, you know, NGOs and doctors, they played their part as well. And uh, four T's were followed. They did tracing, tracking, testing and treating. And this whole 4T operation was designed in quick, timely fashion and it has uh, played its role. It has delivered. So these are the things that other states and as well as other countries as well as other administrators can learn from Taravi. A Neural Network for Development. Now, dear friends, uh, this article is written by Vishwapati Trivedi. He's an author, an IS officer, as well as a former secretary of the government of India. So we know that uh, we need to revive our economy because of this COVID-19 lockdown. Things are, you know, nearly disturbed. Now, government is trying its level best. Uh, it is trying both sides, demand side as well as supply side. Uh, as far as... Uh, rejuvenating our industries are concerned right a repo rate has been reduced by mpc but this is going to help just a formal sector and it not every individual company is going to benefit from this uh, even if what i'm trying to say is that when repo rate is reduced it's not necessary that your that banks will do the same thing right it uh, banks their the transmission is not that great first of all that means if RBI has reduced uh, repo rate by, let's say, 1%, so that does not mean that SBI will also reduce your loan rate by 1%. It may or may not, or maybe 0.25%. So transmission is not that good. First point. Second thing is it will just help formal sector. What about informal sector? So you have to work or you have to cross, you know, you have to walk extra miles to, to help informal sector. So monetary policy, limited impact, fiscal policy, pumping money into MG Narega. So this will create jobs for rural community. That's a good thing, right? Money will come in their hand. If they if they have money, then they will have a sense of uh, well-being, right? Uh, they will be able to spend this money. They will buy some stuff and this will create, uh, you know, demand. And this demand will be fulfilled by this suppliers or industry. Uh, suppliers and industry, they need money as well. Banks, particularly for informal sector, banks will have to take some risk but uh, bankers they feel a bit uh, uh, not that confident because if they give you loan and if uh, this loan becomes an NPA then in future there will be an inquiry or something and then the bankers will be you know they will come under this investigation and no one wants to do this sort of thing so there are many hurdles so this article is saying that the best thing that we can do is we can utilize our MPs the ruling party they have some 274 MP, roughly 50% of the total strength. Then you, if you add NDA partners, then the total is 349. Then you can have some more uh, 60, 70 Rajya Sabha members as well. So this MPs, right, this MPs should be ordered. They should be asked to look after their own uh, constituency, right? MPs, just imagine when your MP will... Uh, be there at grassroots level, MP will be looking after MG Narega, whether distribution is taking place, whether work is taking place or not, uh, unemployment uh, rate, reduction, farm produce. There are so many things that one MP can monitor if MP will stay at grassroots level, if he will go to one place to another, you know, all the time, right? Uh, rather than doing business as usual, rather than staying at bungalow or something, if MP will be out there on the street, when I say on the street, I mean to say that MG Narega monitoring is directly going there and checking things, right? So if each and every MP, let's say 400 MPs, if they start doing these things in their constituency, uh, and I will give you one very good example. You know this, uh, if you go through my daily financial news analysis, then you will find one thing, you will know one thing for sure, that the one of the biggest hurdle for big companies, small companies is demand for labor there is uh, you know lack of supply of labor so most of these labors they come from bihar and up and other states this mps they can get in touch with mps of bihar and up let's say you have one factory here or in your constituency you have 100 factories now most of your you can have a like mp will have a direct contact with this uh, owners of this 100 factories he can ask him that, uh, or he can ask them like what they need or your workers, where they were from, basically. And if they say they are from Bihar, let's say, then MP will directly connect with Bihar's MP. 
and uh, we'll have a discussion like okay if you send me this many 10,000 labors from your area I will assure you their safety and everything and so, you know so this will become more quicker this will become this will be a speedy thing between two MPs they can they can work as a team but this is just example the reason why I have mentioned this article is I think this is out of box a solution this is very interesting solution and uh, this is coming from an IAS officer and more than that uh, this person has worked as a secretary of government of India so he has been part of this system he knows how you know how you can how you can how you can uh, uh, get a job done so this is a very important thing government is doing other things but uh, if you add the strength of MPs right then you can deliver things on time and this performance of MPs uh, during this phase uh, can can act as a sort of eligibility criteria for a next time uh, ticket isn't it and here you find some news items dear friends we are totally out of time so please help yourself with news items they are easy to read right for Hindi students I can understand but for English students all I have to do is throw some important news items for you guys and you can read them isn't it you can you do understand the language so it's not a problem so this items are this news items are important others of course uh, you can go through various different sources and uh, find out uh, so it's not like uh, things are over you can of course uh, scan and you find news items in so many different sources you can read newspapers you can times of india or hindu or any other uh, newspaper local newspaper that you like okay so that's everything. I'll see you soon. Till then, enjoy your studies. God bless you all. Jai Hind.